How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a multi-award winning podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research. For over a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics in over 200 episodes. For the past three years, DNA Today has won the People's Choice Best Science and Medicine Podcast Award. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. Since you're listening to a genetics podcast, I know you're a nerd like me that also likes reading genetic books, watching genetics movies and shows, and there aren't many genetic clubs out there for nerds like us. So we decided to launch a Patreon where we could do just that. This is the benefit that was asked for hands down the most when we were designing our Patreon and we were asking you guys to fill out that survey. So this benefit is an exclusive monthly club where we chat about genetics books or movies or we focus on mentorship and becoming a genetic counselor, like applications, interviews, and boards prep, insight into all of those aspects of becoming a genetic counselor. So if you wanna be in these live monthly Zooms with me and our team, sign up now. The link is in the show notes. And bonus, if you sign up by May 25th, I'm gonna throw in an extra gift in the mail for you. Wanna become a genetic counselor? Looking for ways to engage with the field and boost your resume for grad school applications? Then you should check out Sarah Lawrence's Why Genetic Counseling Wednesday Summer Series. Every Wednesday this June, plus the last Wednesday in May, Sarah Lawrence is hosting a series where you can interact through Zoom with genetic counselors from different specialties. It kicks off on May 31st. You can sign up at slc.edu slash DNA today. Again, visit slc.edu slash DNA today to register to level up your resume for applications in the fall. As a listener of DNA Today, you've probably heard me talk about NIPT, non-invasive prenatal testing that looks for extra or missing chromosome conditions during pregnancy. But did you know there's also a test that can screen for recessive disorders like cystic fibrosis and fetal antigens? Billion to One offers Unity Screen, which does all of this from one blood draw from a pregnant person. Visit unityscreen.com for more information and check out our DNA Today episodes where Billion to One experts joined me to explore non-invasive prenatal screening for recessive conditions. That was episode 224. And red blood cell fetal antigens. That was episode 225. Susan and Rebecca, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm really eager to jump right into things. So Susan, I was wondering if you could start us out by giving us an overview of Alzheimer's disease and really how it affects the brain and cognition. I feel like that might be a good place to start as we, we set the scene, as we kind of learn more about Alzheimer's, especially in the genetic space. Yeah, so I think that most are at least familiar with Alzheimer's disease on some level. It's uh, so common, and, you know, I think it's, it's known as being one of the most feared diseases in the world. I think it's very scary to think about um, losing your memory. I think that's the thing that people are most familiar with because that's the part of it I think that is just so heartbreaking. Um, but it's also a disorder of um, cognition and behavior as well. You know, like other neurodegenerative conditions, the brain structure and chemistry behind it start well before you start actually seeing symptoms of the disorder. It can be up to 20 years before um, is what we've observed. Um, you know, the early signs can differ from individual to individual and, um, you know, it, it typically manifests first as a disorder called mild cognitive impairment. It's kind of like that in-between um, place where we start to see maybe some subtle changes in memory and thinking that don't impact a person's ability to function independently or their daily activities, just kind of inklings that something is not quite right. You know, word retrieval may become difficult, a person may repeat queries, um, they might find it much more difficult to learn new things than they did before. If a person's working, maybe their job performance um, starts to suffer. And it's not really until we see um, uh, more severe deficits that impact daily functioning and ability to 
to function independently, executive processing um, issues, people start not being able to pay their bills on time. Um, they, you know, have uh, poor judgment, you know, maybe crossing the street, they misjudge, you know, if a car is coming, that kind of thing. Um, and then that's really kind of when we start to see it cross over. And it is one of these things that doesn't happen quickly. So if you suddenly see someone having symptoms of what appears to be dementia, it's probably some sort of acute insult, like a stroke or something like that. Um, so it is something that clinicians will monitor over time. So it's one of these things that's different for you and how you were before. And they often rely a lot on, um, you know, reports of family members or others saying, oh, they missed an appointment. They never miss this appointment and, and, you know, things like that. Rebecca, does this resonate with your experience of starting symptoms and how your journey with Alzheimer's began? You know, it was a marvelous explanation. Um, yes, and a little bit no, because everyone is different, I think. So in my case, I uh, had never slept much. And all of a sudden, I started sleeping. I went in for my annual physical. And on the way to my physical, I got lost. And I hadn't really gotten lost much. My very astute primary care physician picked up, especially on the sleeping, because I was sleeping nine, 10 hours a night after a lifetime of four or five hours. And inter- fascinating, mm-hmm. right, that she picked mm-hmm. up on it. An amazing Good often as we get older, we sleep less, yes. right? It's not usually right. that we sleep more. Right. Now, I... So they sent me to memory care. Now my husband and I begin to look back and we realize I had been doing some odd things. First of all, I had a job that required intense social engagement and it wore me out. I I was finding excuses not to go to things. Second, I was having more trouble reading some of the complex charts Now I see my memory has slipped. I used to have a photogenic memory. I could, I could literally quote paragraphs of a book I read, but that's all gone. So it started, mine started a little bit differently than most people I know and read about. Uh, But nonetheless, the symptoms were there. And I think the, um, I'm so glad you talked about it not only being memory, it is about cognition, performance, uh, behavior, social anxiety, these things. So I was caught very, very early uh, because of this amazing primary care physician. But now, after three or four years, I am describing most things that Susan talked about. I think the key thing you mentioned, Rebecca, is a difference for you, right? And that's... That's yes. what that's what it is. And often I think the behaviors, interestingly enough, are often like different. So if someone's like a mild tempered person, they might be more volatile or, or you know, it, it's really interesting how it's like it, you suddenly become different than you were before. And it really catches people's attention who know you. They're like, something's not right, but trying to put their finger on it. I, you know, one of the things I did want to mention so yeah, is that not all mild cognitive impairment becomes Alzheimer's disease, right? right? And I think that this is one of the most important things of this podcast to those who might be wondering and worrying. Only about a third actually progresses to Alzheimer's. And it's really important if people are showing some signs of cognitive impairment to be evaluated because some of the things that are non-Alzheimer's disease um, issues are treatable, like depression and you know, there can be issues with vitamins um, and things like that, that somebody can do something about. So I think, you know, that was one of the other things I had made a note that I wanted to make sure um, that people are aware of. It's it's almost as important to rule out <laughs> Alzheimer's to investigate non-Alzheimer's causes as it is to kind of identify that there's something going on. So I just want to make sure that we covered that. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm-hmm. And really any kind of diagnostic odyssey to rule out conditions can be a really important part of the process and not just assume that, oh, this is the most common one. It must be mm-hmm, this one, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Correct. being in the world of rare disease, we think zebra, not horse mm-hmm, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's that's an important part of it. And, and we know that genetics can play a role in the development of Alzheimer's disease. 
Susan, I'd love to hear, you know, your perspective of, of being an expert in the field, speaking to the specific genes that we know have implications in the disease and that inheritance pattern and, and how that works, especially as someone that I'm in prenatal. So I'm taking family <laughs> histories every day of patients. <laughs> Alzheimer's disease comes up in all, almost every family, right? So what are cases that people like me or just people that have a family history of Alzheimer's should be paying attention to of, hmm, I should look further for right. this? Well, just like anything, I think that we know, you know, for except for in really rare early onset cases, Alzheimer's really is not, doesn't follow what I think most of us think about as the traditional genetics or pattern of inheritance. There aren't really um, only a handful of folks actually have a, a direct genetic cause of, of their Alzheimer's. We think of Alzheimer's as, as, and describe it as being a complex disorder. So it's one of those ones that runs in families, meaning that it's a combination of one or more genes um, and lifestyle factors together that that ultimately help manifest the the disease. It's kind of like I describe it, it's like someone's lined up, you're born with the dominoes lined up, but something has to, to tip the cascade over, so to speak. So just like other disorders that, you know, run in family. So I always say to people, you know, I know what a complex disorder is. It's, you know, people say, oh, I'm not surprised my kid has allergies. It runs in my families. It's an appreciation that there's some sort of hereditary nature to it, but it's not of the nature where it's is a definite causative relationship, um, which is interesting. But, you know, when these disorders run in families, obviously, the closer somebody who has um, Alzheimer's disease is that's related to you, how many people in a family. So if somebody came to me and said, oh, my great great grandmother had Alzheimer's disease, she's the only one, everybody else lives to be 90. I'm not really super worried. If they come and they say, oh, my my mom and her two sisters and my maternal grandmother, you know, all had Alzheimer's disease, then, you know, then you're a little bit more concerned because it's the number of people, how closely related they are to you. Um, and, you know, it, it, it is pretty common. Um, people's empiric risk for Alzheimer's uh, is not really elevated unless they have a first degree relative with the disorder. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of like a, a shorthand to think to yourself, like, how, how concerned do I, do I really need to be about this? Yeah, I think that's a great way of looking at it, that most people are going to have someone in their family with Alzheimer's, especially if you start branching out into mm -hmm. you know, second, third, fourth degree relatives. Like, you know, statistically, there's going to be someone in there. But looking at that concentration, um, and, and I would imagine also to add to your list, Susan, of, of early onset compared to later Correct. onset. Correct. Right? It's kind of always something in genetics whenever we see something earlier. And, and one gene... Yeah, one gene that I was thinking about too, the first one that pops in my head when thinking about Alzheimer's is APOE. So there's been a lot of focus on this in in just media in general, outside of our own genetics world where we're just always talking about DNA, but talking about just major media picking this up because Chris Hemsworth was recently found to have two copies of the E4 allele. Um, so he was doing a the TV show called Limitless. He was just doing a bunch of different tests and then suddenly learned this. And his grandfather had Alzheimer's disease. So you're like, okay, it's someone in the family. But, you know, for someone like him that has two copies of this E4, I'm throwing a lot of verbiage out there. Can you break down what I'm saying, Susan? Talk about APOE. What is this E4 allele? What is Chris's risk at this point? Yeah. So, you know, it, it's kind of funny because, you know, some of these genes become famous thanks to different celebrities who are identified for having them. You know, I think some people are familiar with Angelina Jolie, who had a, um, a mutation, a gene that put her at high risk for breast cancer. And now I think people, he's drawing attention even more so to the APO, a, APOE gene. Um, you know, so APOE is is the most common um, genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. We refer to it as a susceptibility gene, not a causative gene. So like inheriting um, the high risk allele, which is the four allele, um, increases your risk to develop it, but it's neither necessary um, nor required to have Alzheimer's. There's people who develop Alzheimer's that don't have a four allele, and there are people who inherit a four allele and don't get Alzheimer's, right? So, you know, it makes it really tricky when you're trying to advise someone or talk to them about their results or whether or not they want to have testing for this uh, particular gene or not. Um, you know, we about 25% of the population actually carries at least one four allele. We, we actually have two copies of this gene. Um, we inherit one from each of our parents. And 
um, the more copies you have, the higher your risk for Alzheimer's becomes. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a test to be entered into lightly. We actually don't recommend um, people have testing as he did as kind of like a screening routine kind of test. And certainly some people do choose it, but we definitely recommend counseling around it because a, a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate what they're getting themselves into and what it entails and, and, um, and whether or not that's going to be a great choice for them. So if you inherit one copy of the, the four allele, your risk could, could be as high as 40%, right? So you have a greater odds of not getting Alzheimer's than getting it, right? So there's, it's still hope, but then it, it's one of those pieces of information that's always going to be weighing on the back of your head every time you lose your keys or, you know, is this the beginning of the end? Um, so it's like, does that really add value? Are you really going to change things about your life because you found out you had this one four allele? I don't know that you're not going to get married or not have kids or not choose a certain career because you're at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Now, having two copies brings your risk up and actually lowers the average age of onset quite a bit. So the risk could be up to, uh, you know, in the, in the 80th percentile, 87th percentile, um, if you have two copies. So it becomes a little bit scarier. But then again, you know, you still may not develop the disorder. So when he learned that, I'm sure it was a surprise to him. And, you know, people often say to me, like, well, I'm so healthy. I do this and do that. And it's like, it's it's genetics. It's, <laughs> it's It doesn't know that you're Thor. It, <laughs> it's... It's, it's, you you know, you were born that way. I think one of the things that I think I've heard him say, and is often one of those things that people forget about is they look up their family tree, but they forget to look down. And if he only, if the two copies of this gene that he has are both a four, each of his kids has at least one four. So now he's taken away their ability not to know this information. He's now not only worried about himself, you know, it might add increased worry for his children. So, you know, I think these are just some of the things that we think about. And it also is revealing that, you know, a lot of people know the Hemsworth brothers. Correct. So Liam, you know, I'm right. trying to remember all of them in the yeah. moment. We know that their chance is pretty significant, you know, that they have a 75% yes. chance of having at least one four allele, right? So, um, and that's only if if their parents were carriers, uh, both carriers or something else. Basically, now you've just given, this is one of the things I used to tell my students. I'm like, the thing about genetic testing, unlike other medical testing, is it tells information about your family members who may not want to know that information. It, it basically told both his parents, like, I think that maybe that's where your head was going, Kira. Like, it tells both of yes. his parents are definitely carriers. So maybe they didn't want to know that either. So they, they both have to be carriers in order for him to have her- inherited one from each one. So, um, yeah. And, and what about other genes? Are there ones that are causative? Because we're talking about this like susceptibility, like what's the chance of developing Alzheimer's? But is there genes where we can look at, oh, results like, oh, you will inherit Alzheimer's? Does that exist that we know yeah, of? Yes. So in really very rare cases, only like one to 2% of people have Alzheimer's. And it's almost exclusively in people who have like the early onset form of the disease. We define early onset as less than 60 years of age. Some define it as less than 65. These people typically have it in their 40s, right? So it's really pronounced, you typically almost always see it running in families one generation after the other. I think if people have seen the movie Still Alice, she has that form of Alzheimer's disease where, and she was, again, a college professor, suddenly has trouble, you know, recalling words and got lost. And um, it typically tends to progress a little bit faster as well, because you've got, you know, just such a much more robust um, biological um, underpinnings to what's going on behind the disorder. But, you know, most people, you, you would know if you had that kind of family history, um, the age of onset's really telling, um, like you said before, um, in a disorder that you typically see in the aged, if you see it in young people, it's more, much more likely to have some sort of hereditary component to it. But um, most people are, that's, that's not the case for them. If you're applying to genetic counseling grad schools in the near future, I highly recommend checking out Sarah Lawrence's Why Genetic Counseling Wednesday Summer Series. This is the fourth year Sarah Lawrence will be hosting this series where you can interact through Zoom with genetic counselors from different specialties for two hours every Wednesday in June. It actually kicks off on Wednesday, May 31st at noon Eastern. 
As many of you know, I graduated from Sarah Lawrence's program three years ago, and this series was a fun way to interact with prospective genetic counseling students, and I'm really looking forward to meeting more of you during this series. Myself and fellow genetic counselors will share about our roles and answer your questions live. Not only will you hear from GCs in a variety of specialties, you'll also have the opportunity to discuss ethical and social implications of genomic medicine, engage with current students, and learn about the exciting present and projected future of the profession. Anyone who attends all five will earn a certificate of completion and receive an application fee waiver for the grad program in the fall. Register now before we are fully booked. Go to slc.edu slash DNA today. Again, that's slc.edu slash DNA today to be part of this interactive genetic counseling experience. Non-invasive prenatal testing screening has been around for a decade now, as long as DNA Today actually, and the technology has evolved in those 10 years. The screening started to detect Down syndrome, and now billion to one's Unity screen assesses for the chance for pregnancies to have aneuploidies, which are extra missing chromosome conditions, recessive conditions like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell, and the presence of red blood cell fetal antigens. Billion to One named the screening Unity Screen as it brings together fetal screening for aneuploidies and recessive conditions. It also represents uniting pregnant patients in more equitable care. Unity does not require a blood sample from the other biological parent or sperm donor to assess fetal risk, enabling more pregnancies at risk to be affected with recessive conditions to be identified earlier in pregnancy as compared to traditional carrier screening. Billion to One is working towards one goal, to detect disease one molecule at a time. No early with one simple blood test. Visit unityscreen.com for more information. And be sure to check out our DNA Today episodes where billion to one experts join me to explore non-invasive prenatal screening for recessive conditions. That's episode 224. And red blood cell fetal antigens. That's episode 225. And Rebecca, what was your experience with having a diagnosis because there's different ways of having an Alzheimer's diagnosis. It's, you know, as we've been saying, like most of the time, it's not actually through genetic testing. What was your experience like at this early time that you were talking about kind of processing with your partner and your primary healthcare, healthcare provider? Well, I, um, you know, I went through a series of tests and MRIs and PET scans and things like that. I was very fortunate that my insurance, um, company decided that I was so complex they could not figure out what I was going to do they paid for the PET scan so that doesn't always happen Um, that's a feat yeah I was I was very fortunate um I uh it took me a while to find a neurologist that was a good fit and that's one of my messages now I had the luxury of being in a healthcare system that had a lot of neurologists The first one kind of told me, go home, pack my bags, I'm done. Uh, The second one, uh, both use the term uh, early, you know, early kind of stages of Alzheimer's because of the PET scan and because of a particular brain history uh, they seem to think I had. So the second one said, uh, live with joy which was just great. And then she told me exercise, 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 diet, 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 creativity, and social engagement and intellectual engagement. I mean, she literally gave me these orders, a doctor's orders for how to try to stay relatively well. And she believed, and I think there is good research to indicate that sometimes these lifestyle interventions can prolong the period of of relatively good health. I myself think the answer will be drugs and healthcare interventions, kind of good lifestyle interventions in the long run. But anyway, that's what I did. You know, it was devastating to get the diagnosis. I mean, I was just, I had a fabulous career and I loved it. And who wants to, as Susan said, get that diagnosis. You lose, you lose your memories, you lose yourself, you lose your mind. Who wants to be, I mean, I remember my grandmother, I'm actually writing a book about this now, my grandmother being tied in her wheelchair in the nursing home, just looking vacantly. And that all flashed through my mind. 
But thanks to my wonderful neurologist and a great researcher uh, who works on Alzheimer's, I really was able to use science as much as I could understand it about what Alzheimer's is, how long it can last, etc., to to find a good, healthy balance. And I do think that one of the things we're fighting is this stigma uh, that comes from this experience of seeing, you know, our grandmothers and others suffer because there wasn't the kind of health care and kind of drugs and kind of lifestyle intervention 25 or 40 years ago that there is now. So it was a rocky road for me and I spiritually struggled. But I think again, to science and people helped me get a balance. I still have bad, scary days, but most of the time I function well. And it sounds like that neurologist was, that second one was very helpful in terms of not just saying, okay, this is kind of like your life now and much more on the optimism side of, well, this right. is what you can do about it. This is something right. active of changing your lifestyle. I mean, th- there was a fantastic, we're going to link to it in the show notes, Washington Post article written where you're really featured. <laughs> you. And a, a big part of it was talking about just how you're you're very active with exercise and that, you know, you have your your schedule that you're doing and, and just how important that is just for your own mental health and and how it helps in terms of preventing the progression of symptoms there. And, and isn't that so much better than, as you were saying, like, pack your bags, you know, this is kind of your answer. And, you know, so I think that's just so important. And, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, that's obviously good advice for anybody, right? Like be healthier in general, right? Like I should be exercising more. I can see my gym from here. I should be going there after this, you know? Yes. I, you know, I, I forget exactly the layout of the gym, which means it's been a while. <laughs> but, you know, looking at that, I think that's good advice for anybody, especially in the Alzheimer's space. Is there anything, and I'll kind of turn more to you, Susan, where it's anything specific for someone's case of Alzheimer's where we say, okay, this is more of your treatment or prevention versus someone else? It, it doesn't really vary, right? I think the adva- one of the advantages, if you could call it that, of you know knowing that you're at risk, either because of your family history or because you, have, you know your ApoE4 status, right, and, and maybe you have a four, is that you might be motivated to do the things that you should, that we all know we should be doing anyway. Um, I think that it is, it, people will tell you that, that identify and learn that they have a four allele will tell you that a lot of them will make changes. They'll, they'll start exercising and eating better and trying to do those things. You know, there's a saying, what's good for the heart is good for the mind. And, you know, while nothing is proven, you know, data suggests that this may make an impact. And, you know, I think the generation, as Rebecca was talking, I don't think we would identify people as early. I think a lot of people would be in denial. Some people are really good at hiding it. There was stigma. And I think that, you know, the new generation now is is one that's saying like, listen, like, I'm not gonna take this sitting, you know, down. I'm gonna stand up, I'm gonna exercise, I'm gonna live with joy, I'm going to do these things. So I think you know, one of the advantages of having an idea that you're at greater risk maybe, you know, helps prompt you to do the things you should be doing anyway, but it's not like we would tailor a therapy based on your ApoE4 status or not. We, you know, ideally, we're all at risk at 15% risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. We should all be doing these things, right? Um, but it, it doesn't vary depending on what your genotype is. I think people should know, and I don't know about the genetic testing too, I agree with you on that issue, but I do think every person, if they're showing symptoms or if they're over 65, ought to occasionally have some kind of diagnostic testing. Not only can you do things that hopefully will help, you have more time with your loved ones, you can get your affairs in order, and it's a very different kind of time when you know you have a serious disease. It's a serious disease, but it's not yet physically incapacitating. So I chose to take up art. I chose to become an activist. Maybe others choose to garden and play with grandkids. But I think it's really important that 
we train primary care physicians and others and encourage people to get tested. Knowledge is power. It is. I, I feel like we say that at least one, once a month on this show that it's, you know, it's, I mean, that's what we're giving people knowledge through this show. And, and I think that's such a, a great thing to bring up of like diagnostic testing. And I can see this changing in the future. Hopefully more and more insurance companies like yours are going to cover a PET scan, but sometimes they don't. It's very expensive. And then on the other side, I know there's, you know, something called like a spinal tap, which that's very invasive. So I, I've learned through meeting you guys and Susan that Quest offers a blood test, which is less expensive because it's not a PET scan and it's non-invasive because it's a blood draw. Um, so Susan, can you tell us a little bit about the biomarker that it's analyzing? Like, how does this help with diagnosis as Rebecca's bringing up of this being such a crucial part of, you know, diagnosing early, especially to just live your life? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. I mean, I think it's, it's fascinating. So unlike, you know, doing the genetic testing where, you know, okay, I might be at increased risk for this. You may never get it. Um, looking at these biomarkers starts to help you potentially look at, um, you know, the, the signs of the disease potential disease process, right? Um, and so right now the test is really directed at people who are showing symptoms in some capacity to help the doctor um, deter identify risk for Alzheimer's disease and then monitor them longitudinally. Um, the biomarkers that are looked at are two peptides that are produced in the brain. Um, one of the peptides is called beta amyloid 42 and we refer to that as AB42. And the other one is AB40. And um, AB42 is kind of the star of this particular test. Um, it, those who have Alzheimer's disease have trouble clearing this particular um, uh, biomarker. And it can be harmful if it accumulates. Uh, it will uh, build up and potentially create amyloid plaques, um, which are a hallmark feature of Alzheimer's disease. If you do a biopsy or, or look at a brain of somebody with Alzheimer's on, autopsy, they will have these plaques, whereas a healthy brain will naturally clear this AB42. Um, AB40 is something that is not affected, isn't a clearance issue, um, and it shouldn't change over time. And so what we do is over time as, the, as a person's disease progresses, less and less AB42 is cleared, right? And so what we do is we look at the ratio between the 42 and the 40. And over time, the amount of 42 that's cleared goes down and down and down, and that ultimately ends up lowering the ratio. And very low ratios of AB42 to 40 in the bloodstream has been associated with Alzheimer's disease, right? Um, so that's basically what the test is doing. So if, you're, if you have the test done, it's looking at both those biomarkers, it's looking at the ratio, it's seeing how low it is to see, um, to help the clinician in that diagnostic pro process of, of what's going on. Um, it can also help if, it, if the results come back and they have significant symptoms, but the results come back well in the normal range, it might tell the clinician, you know, you might want to look at non-Alzheimer's disease-related um, causes of what's going on here. And potentially maybe it's depression, maybe it's vitamin related. Um, we've seen a lot of cases over time, I think, where people, clinicians have diagnosed somebody with Alzheimer's disease and maybe relied on that a little too liberally and, and missed other things that could potentially um, be beneficial. Um, the other interesting and nice thing about this test is, is, as I mentioned, they can use it to monitor over time. So um, it, uh, any report that's generated will not only show the current result, but it will also show the last five results. So you could actually see a pattern of the ratio decreasing, which the doctor can use to, um, again, you know, evaluate that person's risk for Alzheimer's disease. I think just having that image of when 42 is accumulating and building up, that's leading to issues is really kind of what I'm, I'm getting out of this. And, and, it's so helpful to be able to, it's not just a one and done. You can be looking at this sequentially and saying, okay, we're looking at this in the last five and looking at how that number is either increasing, decreasing, staying the same. And the fact that it's, I don't know if it's necessarily replacing um, of never having to do a PET scan or spinal tap, but I mean, certainly in some cases it can, at least from what I'm hearing. Yeah, I mean, it's the the results thus far are, are comparable to um, PET scans and looking at the same 
biomarkers in cerebral spinal fluid. So you mentioned that this is ribos, uh, cerebral spinal fluid tap that can be done to look at biomarkers. We also have a test that will look at these same factors in the cerebral spinal fluid. <laughs> But people aren't jumping up and down to have a spinal tap. Um, no, and a blood draw is like no big right. deal. Right. I mean, but... I think when it comes down to healthcare, I mean, it, it's access issues, right? And you want it to be easy. You want it to be non-invasive. Um, cost is always a factor as well. So obviously, um, you know, being able to do a blood draw rather than paying for a spinal tap is is going to cost less. So. Um, right. And even mobile phlebotomy is a thing now too. So sometimes companies are taking advantage of that, of a patient that it's not easy for them to come into a hospital or private practice or whatever setting. Um, so I think that just having a blood draw, as you said, it really gets to the accessibility in all these different areas. Um, so it's, it's really incredible to see it. I'm excited to see this being adopted and becoming a gold standard in the field of just, oh yeah, you do your routine blood draw and you just keep track of this number. Um, you know, and, and I, I thought I would just kind of end with, you know, Rebecca, a lot of thing, our, our theme that has come up a lot is living with joy. And, you know, is there any advice you have for people that maybe recently got this diagnosis, um, that maybe you're a little bit further along in the journey of accepting the diagnosis and, and still, you know, kind of striving through that, um, anything that, you know, I know art and spirituality has aided a lot in your positive mindset, anything you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, I, I would first encourage the listeners, who, especially who had gotten a diagnosis or whose care partner has gotten a diagnosis to do their research. I am still struck by the number of people, some of them extremely well educated, some of them researchers who don't bother once they get this diagnosis to push beyond their fear and get some understanding. Now, not everybody can explain things as well as Susan can, <laughs> but there it's are a lot, she has. <laughs> but you can put together enough books and articles. The Alzheimer's Association, and the link will be in the show notes, has fantastic material on what is Alzheimer's. Second, you know, I think finding a group of people who have a similar situation is so important, just as when you're going through any grief or any tragic situation. I was lucky to find a group, and we ended up forming the Voices of Alzheimer's. We'll put that link yes, in the show notes, too. Absolutely. Which is a group of people who have Alzheimer's, who are in the relatively early stages, but who can talk and share. There are support groups, maybe through your community center. It's really important to share information. And then you gotta find what brings you joy. And you know, I didn't know I could be an artist and a friend made me do it and I loved it. I got a dog. That dog is very active, I did it on purpose. <laughs> that helps my cardio. The key to keep doing it, as we know about all formation of good habits, is that you've got to enjoy it. So try to remember that even when you're in the tragic side, this is also a time, at least for some years, that you can give yourself permission to do what you love, to engage, to follow your passion. That's my basic advice, and that passion must include exercise and diet, I think. I think that is just beautiful advice. And what a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Susan, for coming on and just sharing all of this insight. And Rebecca, really want to extra thank you for just opening up and, and sharing your own life and experience, because that's what really resonates with people of hearing others going through journeys, especially if they're a caregiver or if they're, you know, starting this journey themselves. So I just really want to thank, thank both of you for coming on the show. I think this was just fantastic to learn so much from both of you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. It's great fun. Thank it. you, Susan. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. For more information about today's episode, visit dnatoday.com, where you can also stream all 200 plus episodes of the show, including video versions of interviews recorded in 2021 or later. Any questions, episode ideas, guest pitches, or sponsor inquiries can be sent into info at dnatoday.com. Be sure to follow us on social media, especially so you don't miss a giveaway. We are at DNA Today Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and more.
please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. Here's a bonus. If you do and send us a screenshot, I'll give you a shout out on the show. DNA Today is created, hosted, and produced by myself, Kira Deneen. Our team includes communications lead, Corinne Merlino, video lead, Amanda Andrioli, outreach intern, Sonia Tanaiker, social media intern, Kajal Patel, and graphic designer, Ashlyn Anokian. Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.